Katie Shah, your host for The Uma Show. Welcome to your one-stop journey for feeling empowered. We're a platform for change. We build confidence. We are your voice. We want you to be bold, be you, be Uma. Today, we're exploring women in healthcare. And I'm so excited to be joined by our goddess of go-getting, Sari Cassette, who is joining us from California. And she's a clinical psychologist at Thrive Psychology. Welcome, Sarika. It's great to see you. Thank you so much, Rita. I'm so honored to be part of the UMA show. Well, welcome. So you're a girl from Dallas. Your parents are from Delhi. Talk to us a bit about your family, your background, and how you grew up. Yeah, absolutely. So my parents um, were born and raised in Delhi. They met in university over there. And immigrated to the States in the early 70s. Um, and they ended up in Dallas, where both more, my sister and I were born. Uh, we ended up moving around the country a bit due to my dad's job. We found ourselves in Los Angeles, as well as upstate New York. And um, yeah, so we, we had that kind of unique experience of living in different parts of the country, which I think exposed us to of just a lot of different cultures within this country. Mm -hmm. um, my parents also have different cultural backgrounds within India. So my dad's family is Punjabi. My mom's side is from Uttar Pradesh. So even growing up with the different cultures within the household was also interesting to get to know different family traditions, different family histories. Um, I think this really taught us adaptability and just a curiosity in terms of people in general and different oh, ways of being. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing because obviously you've had that different sort of cultural exposure to those different backgrounds and you've traveled around a few places from Dallas to Los Angeles to all different places. Um, is that partially what led to your interest in human behavior and clinical psychology? I think it definitely had an influence for sure. I mean, we were also fortunate enough to travel internationally as well. Um, mm -hmm. My dad has a big passion for traveling um, and I definitely have um, inherited that as well. And so just being exposed to different countries, different types of lifestyles and people, ways of being and living that also fostered my curiosity and human behavior and just why people do the things that they do, um, make the choices that they make and, and just deeper questions about, you know, what are we all here for? What is, what is life about for humans? Um, I also, uh, another influence of mine um, in terms of my path towards psychology was my uh, cousin brother in India who um, whenever we'd visit family in Delhi, uh, he and I would go on these sort of walks talking about different topics. And one of the things that we talk about is psychology. Mm -hmm. um, he's also very advanced in meditation, taught me about meditation. I think that also deepened my interest in the mind and the power of the mind you know, how our minds work. Oh, wonderful. I love that. And also how you have that bond in your family as well. That's such a lovely, lovely story that you just shared for us there. Thank you. So um, you started off initially working in the space of children and adolescents, but for the past 10, 10 years, you've actually been working with women a lot. Talk to us about that and the areas that you help women with. Absolutely. So I think my... Um... I was fortunate to have, be able to have exposure working to different, working with different age ranges and phases of life, um, as well as different cultural backgrounds. And I, I think that's really given me a broader perspective in terms of um, what people may be going through um, based on a certain life phase that they're in. Um, I you know, went from working with young children to teenagers to college students, and then eventually 
um, mostly adult women ages early 20s on upwards through the lifespan. Uh, I, I really love working with women. I think that women are, I just find them to be just very resilient and have a certain strength that, that allows them to persevere in the face of so many different challenges. Um, I mean, as, as you know, especially the work that you do as well, that women these days in the modern world are juggling so many different things in their lives, right? Whether it's career, relationships, could be marriage, raising a family, taking care of aging parents, et cetera. Um, on top of that, you know, we have so many different pressures and influences that can kind of cloud our own um, inner voice, being told how to be in the world, how to appear. Um, we may be met with various forms of discrimination that are unique to women, like sexism and ageism. And then of course, for women of color, racism gets added to the mix. Sometimes classism gets added to the mix and you have this whole set of complex um, variables that can be challenging, you know, on top of personal traumas and unique mm. experiences you know, for each woman. Yeah, I mean, I love that you shared that. That is exactly what we deal with as well, a lot of at UMA. It's not just a, a black and white scenario where someone has a bad day or someone can't get a job or someone can't feeling differently. There are so many different constructs to that. Their family backgrounds, um, what um, is going on We're at a child's school, for example, what is going on from somebody's background? You know, is there something definite, different professionally than is going on in the personal life? Is there a different construct there, you know? Um, so really, really um, well said. Um, and as you know, a big part of what we do is empower women and grow confidence. So tell us a little bit more about the work that you do that fosters the self-confidence while working through personal difficulties, ultimately reaching your client's true potential. Yeah, sure. So my, my hope is that in the work that I do with women that I'm able to help provide a space um, that is safe and allows for women to really get in touch more so with their deeper inner knowing, you know, and they're kind of their own voice that can get clouded by so many different influences as we talked about. Um, I think, you know, women especially are natural caretakers. We tend to give so much of ourselves that um, in the work that I do, I hope to provide a space that is just for them. Yeah. And, um, and in terms of helping to foster that self-confidence, that can look kind of different from one woman to the next in terms of their unique set of challenges and circumstances. But sometimes it's about working through personal traumas or challenges. It could be a relationship challenge. It could be a career challenge. It could be something from much earlier on in their lives. Um, sometimes we may start with one specific issue. And as we uncover more and more, we realize that actually it's connected to so many other things that may have happened in their lives. Um, and as these connections are made and the space is allowed to express feelings um, and you know, even just verbalize what someone has gone through, that that in itself can be healing and transformative in some way. Absolutely. Um, and as you said, your work really spans a vast array of specialties. Talk to us about these. Um, how do you actually integrate your different treatment models? Sure. Well, so I'm, I'm still learning. I, I'm, you know, I think that the more I learn, the more I realize that how little I really know. And I'm constantly working to expand on um, the different techniques and treatment models that I bring into the work. Um, but 
to answer your question, um, I, I like to have an integrative approach because I feel that, um, you know, there's no one size fits all. And the more tools that I have um, to offer clients, the more likely I'm able to help meet their needs. Um, yeah. So I, in addition to what I'll kind of refer to as like traditional talk therapy methods, I bring in um, mindfulness-based techniques, which mm -hmm. you know, really draws a lot from meditation. And um, it, it's really about helping people to be more present in the moment, to foster a deeper awareness of what's happening in their bodies, you know, often, especially in this modern world, we tend to stay in our thinking mind um, and constantly sort of consumed by our thoughts that when we can drop down into the body and recognize just how much information there is there, how much wisdom we hold there, that, um, that things can start to shift. I also bring in techniques from the expressive arts therapies, um, which is an area that I have been learning about and you know incorporating tools mm -hmm. into my work as I find that having a nonverbal method um, or set of techniques can be really helpful when we're having difficulty expressing things in words. Um, and can be another way of helping someone to process what's going on for them um, or an, an uncover something deeper. Yeah, really well said. You know, I also love initially how you said that you don't, you're still learning because you've got obviously over a decade's experience working with women on this, plus all of your adolescent and child experience on top of that. But that's really important lesson that we are always learning, no matter how proficient we are in what we're doing. We all have to know that. You don't know what you don't know and things are always changing. And that helps when you're speaking, especially dealing in the area that you deal with and what we do at UMA as well, is that everybody is unique and different only because something works for one person. It really doesn't matter or doesn't mean that that is actually gonna work for somebody else. And I think that's really where you hit the nail on your head by expressing that. Um, so I wanted to go more into your um, art therapies that you mentioned. Um, talk to us a little bit more about that because you actually do work with creative individuals from the arts professions in different ways. So how do you actually manage to incorporate some of these um, expressive art therapies into your treatment sessions? Sure. So my interest in this area, I mean, actually started when I was working with children, but I think became even stronger when I was working um, at a college counseling center at a school uh, that specializes in the art and design fields. And what I noticed is um, that some students really had trouble verbalizing certain mm -hmm. things. And I thought about, well, what if I tried to kind of use their language more? Um, you know, whether they're a visual artist um, or even bringing in sort of kinesthetic uh, language, you know, like movement, um, ways that were more nonverbal into the therapy to help kind of deepen that process for them um, or see, you know, what, what does this help uncover for them? And, um, you know, I found that a lot of the students really responded to this. Um, and of course, it depends on one person to the next, whether this, they're drawn to such techniques or not. But that's really where my interest um, sort of deepened in this area. And then later on, I went to get some further training. And it's something that I'm, of course, still learning how to incorporate into my work. Yeah, and the more you do it, the more you kind of find out the different nuggets of how to incorporate as well. So um, I guess um, you must have felt some challenges um, along the way in your experience um, as, a, as a clinical psychologist. Can you share any examples with us and p potentially how you managed to get over those? Sure. So, you know, as a clinical psychologist, I think one of the 
hardest lessons to learn is, you know, I think initially there is this such a deep passion and drive to help people and really want um, when you, especially when you see the potential in someone to really help them overcome um, often very, very difficult circumstances and challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one of the things that I had to learn was that, you know, it's not all up to me and that um, modifying a certain expectations that are really allowing the person's journey to unfold as it is supposed to unfold for them. And me really being there to help assist, support, and guide. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that was one of the things as well as um, really creating my own space for myself to take care. Um, I think not only for health professionals, but everybody, yeah. self-care, you know, especially for women is just so important. So really finding that balance for myself um, mm. has been hugely helpful as well. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I've got a second because it's something that is so easy to forget. When, especially when you're a woman, you are always putting other people's wants and needs first, whether you're a parent, whether as a wife, whether as a professional workforce. And sometimes because you're always doing that and trying to do the best you possibly can, at the end of the day, you can be drained and you've forgotten to even think about and look after yourself. But if you don't feed and nourish yourself, then in a way, you can't be all of those other things in the best way you can. So I love how you go back to that challenge as being the optimal, because that's something that I think we can all learn um, in life, in every walk of life, really. So um, thank you for sharing that. Of course. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about your um, outside work life. What do you like to do in your spare, in your spare time? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess not surprisingly, I have a creative side. Um, and, and that's, you know, partly why I'm interested in the expressive arts therapies. Um, I, I love to do anything creative. I've taken art classes throughout my life whether it's painting or photography. Um, I also love international travel. Of course, that was an interest that started early on in my childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever I get the chance to um, explore a new country or city, I uh, love learning about different cultures, meeting people from all walks of life. And um, I'm also a big beach lover, which is, I think one of the reasons why I ended up back in Southern California after being in New York for so many years. Um, the ocean is just something that I find very nurturing, it really feeds me. Oh, I second that. And you know, I, I missed the day where I, I was actually in California and for a while now, just traveling international full stop, but yes. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. Before we let you go, Sarika, what words of wisdom can you give to any young girls or young women watching today um, who want to maybe follow in your footsteps? No, I would say if you're wanting to explore clinical psychology, um, definitely just learn as much as you can. Expose yourself to materials, talk to people in the field, um, just whatever, learn about people in various contexts. I and mean, this is, this is a field where I think it's a unique in, in a certain way where you're really looking at the whole person. So it's almost like anything that you learn, um, in life is going to end up, you're going to bring it into your work in some way or it's going to um, help a client in some way. So I think really making space for yourself as well, like whether it's self-care, a time for self-reflection, um, making space for activities that bring you joy, that, that that is also going to help you in this kind of work because the more that we work on ourselves, take care of ourselves, 
heal our own um, traumas or, you know, whatever it is that challenges that we may be facing, that that's only going to enhance um, this kind of work that you do for others. Well, thank you so much for sharing your words of wisdom there with us and your tremendous journey. Sari Gasset, clinical psychologist at Thrive Psychology. And thank you so much to our viewers for joining us on this empowerment journey today. We want you all to embrace that inner goddess of go-getting. We want you to be bold, be you, be Uma.